Mark, in the evolving story of NATO. How important is this, this summit in Madrid? I think in one sense it's a sad juncture because these are two countries, Sweden and Finland, that have spent many years, decades, trading a very careful line uh, with Russia, not to upset the apple cart, uh, recognizing the sensitivity of uh, the alliance just on the doorstep of Russia, but now feeling that the security situation has deteriorated so significantly, not just around Ukraine, but that we've entered a new era of insecurity, that they feel that they must now join this club. They need the protection of Article 5. They need to be part of this uh, alliance. And I think this has gone against what Russia was expecting when they joined uh, Ukraine. But it is symbolic uh, of the turning point in our history, and that's worrying for everybody. Can I just ask a rather uh, silly, uh, at risk a silly uh, layman's question? We just flashed up a picture of uh, Erdogan, the Turkish leader. Um, what do you say to those who argue, and I'm even inclined to argue it myself, that w w within NATO, uh, Turkey exerts too much influence? They, they can't work out, it seems to me, it will seem to others, at times whose side they're on. They seem to be quite friendly towards Moscow at a time like this. Yes, I mean, Turkey uh, is an interesting position, and you're right to highlight what they've done uh, in playing a bit of a game here uh, by claiming that there are Kurds in Sweden, particularly, uh, that are somehow linked to the PKK, the terrorist organization that uh, Turkey uh, is up against, and therefore used it as leverage to gain concessions to do with F-16s, um, which they've now achieved. The agreement has taken place, and that's because uh, NATO works by consensus. Um, ultimately, it's better to keep working with Turkey. They need to recognize, as do other countries, I have to say, Brazil, South Africa, India as well, uh, that the threat is against Putin and the Kremlin, not against the Russian people per se. And uh, we need to up our game. We are too risk averse. NATO itself is shoring up its own defenses with inside that club, but it's not willing to put the fire out right outside the club, that, uh, as we see in Ukraine. And the consequences of that is that fire is likely to spread to other parts of Eastern Europe. Uh, four or five months ago, when this conflict in Ukraine was beginning, that the conversation uh, on the airwaves ran to the idea of seriously expanding defence expenditure. People were talking about three and a half, four percent of GDP. Uh, that's gone away. I don't think it's gone away. But there's now absolute focus on what we should do with our defence spending. You can't have ministers and people like myself, even the head of the army, the CGS, uh, suggesting that there's now a 1937 feel to the world at the moment and then not react to that. The world is more dangerous and going to get more dangerous, not less. We need to up our defence spend. We're on a peacetime budget at the moment. Last year, we saw swathing cuts to our armed forces personnel, 10,000 in the army, to tanks, to armoured fighting vehicles, uh, Hercules aircraft, scrap, F-35 fleet reduced as well. These all now need to be reversed. We've entered, as I say, uh, a, a new geopolitical framework, uh, and we need more money to be able to pay for that. And ultimately, because inflation is where it is, that's going to see a real-time reduction in our defence spending. NATO itself, on its own figures that I've put out on my tweet, so that by 2025, we're down to 2%. Uh, and that's not including the, the inflationary figures heading towards double figures now. So if we want to lead by example, we've done well in supporting Ukraine. We do need to increase defence spending immediately.